Well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Sean Murphy. I'm president of Charlotte Atheist and Agnostics. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. I would like to thank the Secular Student Alliance here at uh, UNCC for co-hosting and providing us with this room. Really appreciate it. It helps us a lot. Um, tonight we are fortunate enough to have two speakers from the American Humanist Association. Um, I'm going to introduce them out of order. I'm going to talk about our second speaker first. So his name is Royce Beckhart. He's executive director of the American Humanist Association. He has also made numerous appearances on television, radio, and print. Uh, his talk title today is In It to Win, Building a Non-Theist Rights Movement. Our first speaker is Maggie Ardiente, Director of <coughs> Development and Communications for the AHA. And she's editor of the e Design Humanist Network News that reaches over 40,000 subscribers weekly. Uh, her talk is Humanism Today, an update from the AHA. I'm very excited to hear from both of our guests tonight. So let's first, please join me in welcoming Maggie Arian. Can you hear okay in the back? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I'll just speak very loudly. Okay. Well, thank you again for having us. It's a real honor to be here. I'm, um, I'll mention briefly that I was vice president of the James Madison University Freethink Group when I was in college. So, big fan of Secular Student Alliance and all of its wonderful affiliated groups. So, thank you very much for having us. Um, despite the negative perception against people who don't believe in God, it's never been a more exciting time to be an atheist. The American Human Association is proud to be one of the leading organizations working for the non-religious. The AHA currently has over 23,000 members and supporters, and over 120 followers, 120,000 followers on Facebook, and those numbers are climbing, so we're very excited. Our goal at the AHA is very simple, to promote the idea that you can be good without a belief in God. In Washington, D.C., we, re we represent atheists, freethinkers, agnostics, and the nuns or religiously unaffiliated and work to remove the fear of coming out as an atheist. AHA lobbies regularly in Congress to support church-state separation and other progressive issues. We file lawsuits when our free speech rights are being violated, and we support over 160 local groups to build free thought communities. Um, it's been a very busy time at AHA in recent weeks, and a lot of this has to do with the state of North Carolina, and Charlotte in particular. So thank you very much for keeping us very busy at the office. Um, first, there was the state official who tried to introduce the bill recognizing uh, state religion. Uh, I almost wanted this to pass, just to see religious groups fight over what that religion was going to be. Uh, but the big news, of course, was the announcement of Charlotte Mayor Anthony Fox's nomination, or Anthony Fox being nominated to be President Obama's Transportation Secretary, who also proclaimed a National Day of Reason, which was just this past week. Um, so thanks to you. National Day of Reason gained more press in this year than years before. Coverage in U.S. News and World Report, Washington Post, Associated Press, and of course Fox News. Uh, Fox News, they brought on Penny Nance, president of Concerned Women for America, uh, who criticized National Day of Reason by implying that reason led to the Holocaust. Uh, this is exactly the kind of rhetoric that we atheists and humanists have to deal with on a daily basis, which is what we're working on right now. Um, and I've been telling everybody to take a look at what happened here in Charlotte and the work that you did um, for Mayor Anthony Fox and how important it is for everyone to reach out to their mayors and their elected officials um, to get things like National Day of Reason and Darwin Day sponsored. That is a big deal. Anybody could suddenly be nominated for the cabinet. Um, speaking about our line, and so in addition to National Day of Reason being proclaimed in a lot of cities uh, across the country, uh, in Congress we were able to get Representative Mike Honda from California and D.C. Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton to also support National Day of Reason, so we're very excited about that. Um, speaking of our lobbying efforts in D.C., this year we were also excited to reintroduce for the second time a resolution in Congress declaring February 12th as Darwin Day, thanks to Representative Rush Holt of New Jersey and eight other co-sponsors. The Darwin Day Resolution is the first sponsored House resolution put forth by a free thought organization in history, a formal recognition of the academic contributions of Charles Darwin, and the support of, um, or actually, the denouncement of attempts to insert intelligent design and creationism in public schools. Our legal team is ramping up our efforts as well. The Apignani Humanist Legal Center employs two staff attorneys and has built a network of over 50 lawyers across the United States take action when atheist rights are being violated. 
The AHA has successfully intervened in over a dozen cases this past year, from protecting the rights of students to wear anti-religious clothing, to defending atheist advertisements on public buses. Uh, we just filed a lawsuit against a public school in Mississippi that held a Christian assembly during school hours, and when students attempted to leave the assembly, they were refused. Uh, but it's not enough to do just lobbying and just lawsuits. Our education center develops humanist curriculum so that local chapters can establish humanist education programs for youth, particularly important if we are to instill values like critical thinking in our next generation. Um, our affiliate organization, the Humanist Institute, which provides half of a master's degree in humanist studies, has just been accredited by Saybrook University in San Francisco, laying the groundwork for jobs in humanist studies. We train and certify humanist celebrants, so we can have more people performing non-religious weddings, funerals, and other types of ceremonies. And as I mentioned before, we have over 160 local chapters across the country. We're one of the largest among the national Greenbelt groups. Now, I mention all of these projects because these days, most people think that the American Humanist Association does one thing and one thing only, and that's try to destroy Christmas. <laughs> Which is a little true, but not all true. <laughs> um, today, our biggest challenge is how do we reach out to the religiously unaffiliated, this 19% of all Americans? This question launched the AHA's advertising campaign in 2005 to reach out to other humanists. That was our goal. Um, we first began with full-page advertisements in major newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post, progressive magazines like The Nation and American Prospect. Uh, the AHA's first humanist billboard in 2008, which appeared near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and co-sponsored with Free Thought Action with this guy right here, Joseph Stewart, um, garnered significant press and controversy for its bold statement, don't believe in God, you're not alone. The AHA later established billboards and sponsored bus ads in other cities across the country, particularly in Washington, D.C., and usually around the holiday season. Our past ad campaigns include one that featured Santa Claus and the words, Why believe in a God? Just be good for goodness' sake. And another campaign called Consider Humanism, which compared extreme Bible quotes with promoting quotes humanism, me. which aired uh, during NBC. It also resulted in my all-time favorite piece of hate mail, which we usually get a lot of, especially during Christmas. And so I'd like to read a short piece of this uh, hate mail to you. Uh, this letter is from a person named Don. And he writes, you people are complete idiots. People like you are the reason this country is in a downward spiral. I'll see you in hell and will voice my opinion there more intensely. <laughs> <laughs> so if you see a guy named Don, and we all go to hell, he's going to talk to us. Anyway. <laughs> Our most recent advertisement this past uh, December drew attention to our new website, kidswithoutgod.com, an online resource for kids and teens to learn more about humanism through interesting videos, fun games, and practical advice, such as how to deal with bullying and religious proselytizing in, in schools. Um, the ads feature a young kid with the words, I'm getting a bit old for imaginary friends. <laughs> that one was a little bold. We had a debate at the office whether how we should do that, but it worked out. Um, so these ads and all the programs, it's just a small fraction of, of everything that we really do at AHA. Um, and when we think about the millions of dollars that groups like Focus on the Family, Alliance Defense Fund, you know, these are people that are doing more than, than simply saying, we're Christian, we're Christian people, and we want more people to be Christian. They're actively putting their funds and their efforts to win cases against gay marriage, against women's advancement, against women's rights, and against the rights of atheists and humanists like you and me. So it's not enough to just come out and say that you're an atheist. You have to act out. You have to be part of local groups, and you have to really be involved. Um, I truly believe that we're in the midst of a civil rights movement for non-believers. The right to live free from religious coercion, and the right to question the existence of God. And it's worthwhile to remind ourselves that we, as free thought activists, are working on behalf of so many people who feel the need to remain in the closet about their atheism people who are afraid of losing their jobs, kids who are being afraid of being kicked out of their homes. Um, so to be a member of a local atheist group like this really does make a difference, and we really thank you for your involvement. So I encourage you uh, to learn more about AHA, to join as a member, to join us on Facebook, um, and learn more about the work that we do every day on your behalf. Thank you very much. So now I'll go ahead and introduce Roy. He's the executive director of the AHA. Um, he's been executive director for 10 years, 
and has appeared on Good Morning America, CNN Headline News, National Public Radio, and Fox News. Um, when Roy appeared on Fox News, he debated Bill Donahue of the Catholic League. And Bill Donahue called Roy a cannibal because if you don't have the Bible to guide your morals, we all turn into cannibals. <laughs> and our favorite person in the world, Mr. Bill O'Reilly, he called Roy the head humanist. He said it like it was an insult, but I think if Bill O'Reilly insults you, you know you've made it in this world. Please welcome Roy Specker. How is how that value of the folks in the back? This one? Well, then, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back on if I need we'll leave it um, So, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some changes that have been occurring in America that I think some people have started to see, but I think there's some details to it that help, realize, help us realize what direction we want to go in. Um, as you know, the number of people who would vote for an otherwise qualified candidate for public office who happens to be an atheist is a low number. It's, it's rising slowly. I think it was 46% and 47%. I think maybe we're at 48 right now. I forget what the latest number is. However, it still puts us in last place compared to any other religious group or minority group in the country. Um, it has a st that, that's, that's otherwise perceived positively. Those negatively were also uh, pretty low down the list. I think we're tied with rapists as far as people you would vote for otherwise, who was a qualified candidate for public office. Uh, so the truth is, you know, there is this prejudice that exists against us, against our community. And we want to move from this place of prejudice to one where there's tolerance, to a place where there's mutual respect, to a time when there's common appreciation for the reason-based, science-oriented approach to solving problems that we have. One area where change is overdue is uh, in the court system, in the, in the rights of our growing minority as it pertains to what we can do to defend ourselves in courts. And whether we recognize it or not today, we are actually, and this sounds a little ominous, but we're held uh, captive to the uh, religious right leaders who remind us of our inferior position by using the power of government to enforce laws that put truth claims about religion before us at every turn. Now, it's not some sort of conspiracy but they definitely have a willful effort to make this happen. And they have a, lot of, have a lot of money and organization behind it. And there's examples that give evidence for this. We have to endure statements about our nation's trust in a fictional God, not just on our money, but also on public buildings and in ceremonies for public office, from census worker to president. Our children and grandchildren have to hear a statement that excludes them and their family every day in school. And if that weren't bad enough, they're asked to stand up and join with the majority in saying, We have to watch on as our neighbors go unpunished for child abuse because they claim religious exemptions to certain laws. And such exemptions may also apply to vaccinations that leave our, leave our own children more vulnerable to disease. We have to spend our tax dollars in schools in most states where te many teachers refuse to teach that the evidence massively supports a theory of evolution that tells us everything we know about biology, or it unites everything we know. And in an even more blatant display of unfairness, our tax dollars are spent in religious charitable organizations that exclude us from employment and exclude us even from their services. And the more we come out of the closet in certain communities, as people who don't happen to believe in a God, the more we observe new limitations in our business, opportunities, and public life. And perhaps what's worse is that the legal battles our movements engaged in, in order to improve our predicament, are losing at an unprecedented and unacceptable rate. So, we used to be successful, of course, in the courts, right? We remember back in the days of, uh, or at least read about them in school, I know I did, <laughs> um, about Ellery Shemp, who 50 years ago, this later this month, actually, uh, the anniversary of it, where he won that case that uh, forbade Bible teachings in public schools. And then there was Vashti McCollum's case, just around the same time, a little before him actually, where it, he, she won the right to uh, for, forbid actual public prayers led by the uh, school officials. And so there were a lot of victories like that in the 60s and the 70s and so forth. Um, 
that we look for and we think, oh, well, the courts are bastard. We can go to the courts for relief when we have troubles. Um, however, that has changed. <laughs> and one of the reasons it's changed is that judges are less sympathetic to our cause than they used to be. And that didn't happen by chance. When Michael Newdow's first case against under God and the Pledge of Allegiance was being considered, George W. Bush said, quote, it points up to the fact that we need common sense judges who understand that our rights were derived from God, an implication that he intended to directly violate the constitutional prohibition against a religious test for public office. Then, Bush ended a 50-year history of using the advice of the American Bar Association to consider judicial candidates, replacing the ABA with the advice of the Conservative Federalist Society. And unlike his predecessors, when it came down to what he actually chose, um, he went on to appoint only conservative Catholics and evangelical Christians to the federal bench, uh, stacking it against us and anybody who might want a strong First Amendment. And he did that um, in a way that was unlike his father and unlike Reagan, who appointed much more um, broadly religiously focused judges to the federal bench. So, uh, while devotees of the religious right may not understand the workings of the universe as well as humanists and atheists do, they certainly understand the power of money, and they have been very good at figuring out how to challenge us in the courts. Uh, for instance, now, when we claim there's a religious monument on public land, they sell a portion of that land just big enough for uh, the monument to a church or other private entity. Now, when we claim our right to be free of religious indoctrination, they claim their free speech is being threatened. Now, when we claim the government is imposing sectarian religion, they undermine our standing to even bring the lawsuit. What's the result? Sadly, as a movement, at least when it comes to the precedent-setting cases, we're losing more and more. And the main problem with bringing establishment clause cases today is standing. And even if cases where plaintiffs do have standing, the courts increasingly are reluctant to rule on establishment clause grounds. Courts tend to justify government endorsement of religion as accommodation, or as historically acceptable, or as uh, de minimis, such as in God we trust challenges. So let's delve a little deeper into what that means so that you can see how that works. First of all, what's meant by standing anyway? Any uh, budding lawyers or lawyers in the audience that want to tell us about standing? No. <laughs> um, well, in order to get the courts to hear your case, you have to show that one, you've been wronged or injured. Two, that something can be done about it. And three, that you're the right person or organization to bring the complaint. So it's normally not enough to say, I'm a taxpayer in this government case tax back tax in the days when we were winning, called Blast v. Cohen, which created an exception to allow taxpayer standing for people in church-state separation cases. Because there's otherwise almost no way to bring those types of cases, thought the courts back then. 